Amen. We're talking about uh, how to build an apostolic center. And I keep trying to come up with new ways to describe that because people uh, ask me questions during the week that means they don't quite understand what I'm saying. So call it a church that affects a whole region with the kingdom of God, okay? An apostolic center is, is, is really a kingdom center. It is a church that affects the whole region by establishing the kingdom of God in that region, okay? It's more than a local church, but it includes the pastoral care and things of a local church, but it really has a, a regional mandate, okay? Our, our theme verse is Proverbs chapter uh, 24, verses 3 and 4. Uh, by wisdom, a house is begun to be built, and through understanding, it is established and made strong, and through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare, precious, and beautiful treasures. Okay? So what, what this is saying is, is that we can begin to build something. We get some wisdom. We get some, some insight from the Father, some direction. We start to build something, but it says unless we understand how to build it, what we're trying to build, what it looks like, how it's to function, it said it won't become strong. It will never really be established. It will eventually crumble. It will fold. It will not become all that God wants it to become. And, and, and then it says, after, then with knowledge, we, we can fill its rooms with, with, with rare, precious, and beautiful treasures. And the greatest treasure is the presence of the glory of God, right? But we don't get the glory of God because we have it built with understanding. That's why we have to build with understanding. Um, so, so far, we've discovered that an apostolic center is, is uh, to, in order to be an apostolic center, we must commit to an apostolic focus, and we've said that focus is Jesus, okay? Fix your eyes on Jesus, our apostle, and, and, and the foundation of our faith. Uh, we must commit to, be, to the apostolic mandate. The apostolic mandate uh, is to be sent into the world around us to invade, to occupy, and to conquer. And I really encourage you, to, please don't miss any of these, the, these sessions that we're looking probably most of the fall at this, uh, um, and if you miss one, go online and watch it, okay? Because we need you to have a, a complete understanding of what God wants to do in our midst, okay? Third thing we learned last week is that to be an apostolic center, we have to be committed to apostolic prayer, which we learned last week is about for the purpose of, of establishing God's kingdom, advancing God's kingdom, okay? Even in our own prayer times, remember? Like, Lord, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come on earth, in my job, in my school, in, in my, my business, wherever I am, Lord, let your kingdom come. In my neighborhood, let your kingdom come in, into these places, okay? Uh, those things are so important. We're gonna, next week, we're going to start looking at worship, apostolic praise and worship. You're going to hear things you've never heard before. You're going to have an understanding of music you've never had before, and you're going to click into or lock into an understanding of why a lot of times you struggle or we struggle, uh, uh, in, 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 even though we're trying to serve the Lord, there, there's some hindrances. We don't understand that. As we get into praise and worship next week, you're going to understand that. Um, okay, so today I want to look more about apostolic prayer, though, and specifically corporate apostolic prayer. And obviously the best way to do that is look in the Bible and see how apostolic prayers were affected or effective in the Bible, okay? Uh, first thing in, in, in concerning corporate apostolic prayer, it's regular prayer. And, and this is a challenge. It's been a challenge for our church for the last few years to, to do this, but we've, we've got to look at this. We're going to be the center God wants us to be. Acts chapter 1, verse 14 the first time prayer is mentioned in the book of Acts, this is all it says. It says they all, or they join together constantly in prayer. They join together constantly in prayer. You know, right after Jesus ascended into heaven, the first time corporate prayer is mentioned, all the Bible says is they join together constantly in prayer. So, so the early apostles understood that corporate prayer was vital to what Jesus wanted to do in their midst. Not just all of us praying in our own prayer time at home, but, but they understood that getting together to pray was vital if God was going to see his kingdom established uh, in, in, their, in their era, which it, at that time was Jerusalem. Okay? If we're going to be an apostolic center, we're going to need to have a greater commitment to corporate prayer. 
And, and honestly, as a congregation, we haven't had a very good track record the last couple of years. As a matter of fact, the last two prayer summits uh, um, we, we hosted last year only had a handful of people in each meeting. Uh, that's not going to change anything. Uh, you know, it, 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 we're going to do a little bit of praying, but it's really not going to change the region when only four, five, six, seven people get together. Okay? And I'm not saying that as condemnation. I'm just saying if we're going to be what God has called us to be, and if we're going to influence this region, there has to be some sort of commitment to corporate prayer. But not just corporate prayer. It's not just about getting together. It's about getting together for a very specific reason and to pray very specific prayers. Uh, let me say this, that today we had, as part of our worship time, intercessory prayer. Okay? Now, it was good. It was refreshing. It was important. But really, I would say maybe only 10 to 15% of what we prayed was actually apostolic prayers. The rest were more pastoral prayers, intercessory prayers, uh, uh, things like that. The, the, and, and although that's good, I want to teach you about, pr- about apostolic prayer today, corporate apostolic prayer. So Rick did a great job and lead us in intercessory prayer, but there's something that we need to lock into that's even more than that. Okay? So the first thing that, that apostolic prayer is, it's regular. They got together regularly for corporate prayer. Second thing is that that apostolic prayer is always submissive prayer. We're not coming to God to try to convince him to do what we want him to do. That's not apostolic prayer. We're not trying to manipulate him or to, uh, we're not trying to have presumptuous prayers. You know, like, uh, oh God, I know you want to bless me, so I'd I'd love that brand new Mercedes. Uh, You know, just uh, thank you, Lord. No, that's presumptuous prayer. Okay. Now, maybe God wants you to have that car, but until he tells you he wants you to have it, you don't know. Okay. The second time that corporate prayer is mentioned in, in, in the New Testament, or in, 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 after Jesus rose from the dead, is Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 26, where Peter stood up among all the believers, and he said, Look, Judas has died. He took his own life. He's no longer alive. We need to replace him as one of the twelve. Now, there were other apostles after, but there was this twelve. And, and, and Peter said, We've got to replace the twelve or replace Judas among the twelve. And so they proposed two men that had good reputation, were full of the Holy Spirit, men of character, men, men of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then this is what happened. Acts chapter 1, 24 and 25. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. You know their hearts, God. We see their works. We see their effectiveness. We see their reputation. We see the outside. But God, you know everybody's heart. You know what's on the inside. And we can always be tricked, right? Man looks at the outward things, but God looks at the heart. So they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you've chosen. God, which one do you want to take over this apostolic ministry? Lord, show us. That's an apostolic prayer. Lord, show us. We don't want to go do anything, go anywhere, do anything, if you don't show us. If you don't tell us what to do. Lord, we got a lot of great ideas. We're very creative people. We're full of your Holy Spirit. we got all these great ideas. Uh, uh, but, Lord, that's not enough. We need to know what you want us to do. What do we really need to do right now? What is your will right now? We don't want to go anywhere until you tell us. And so they said, Lord, show us. Show us what you want. What do you want us to do? We submit completely to your will if you would just show us what you want. And we're willing to wait till you show us. But as soon as you show us, that will do. See, whenever the apostles didn't know what to do, they waited until God show, showed them. Okay? And if we're going to be an apostolic center, we need to take the time to seek God's will for every step that we take. Not, you know, not maybe what type of toilet paper to get, right? But everything that affects the, 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 the direction and the movement and, 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 and the expansion of the kingdom of God, Lord, what... Do you, show us, just show us what you want us to do. So it was submissive prayer. Apostolic prayer is always God. You're, you know, Jesus said, I will build my church. You know, Jesus never said, build, your, build my church. He said, no, you make disciples. I will build my church if you'll make disciples. Okay? Instead, we tried to build a church and nobody's making disciples. Or very few. He said, no, you got it wrong. You, you just make disciples, I'll build my church. And the church I build, the gates of hell, will not be able to prevail against it. Okay? 
Third time corporate prayer is mentioned is in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 30. And we're just going to look at a few key verses there. But this is right after Peter and uh, John had been put in jail for preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They've been telling people about Jesus. And they were thrown in jail. The next day, they were sternly warned, don't you dare mention the name of Jesus again. And, and it said, they said, we can't help. I'm sorry, we, we, we can't help but tell about Jesus. He's changed our lives. He is our Lord, our Master, our Savior. We would rather be put back in jail than to promise to never speak his name again. And so they were, they were threatened, and then they were released. And immediately, they went back to the believers, and they shared with the believers what had happened. And immediately, they went to prayer. They had a corporate prayer meeting. They didn't say, oh, no, this is so terrible. What do we do? No, they, they prayed an apostolic prayer. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to look at it for a few minutes. Acts chapter 4, verses 24 to 31. When they heard this, what? The report of the, the two apostles, uh, um, Peter and John. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer. Remember I said when you go into your own prayer room, it says, get quiet. Well, here it says they raised their voices. Corporate prayer, apostolic prayer is, is, is rather loud. Okay. They raised their voices in prayer to God, together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? This is right out of the book of Psalms. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Boy, that prayer is filled with the word Jesus, isn't it? And after they prayed, it's also filled with the word we. You know, there's no apostolic prayer in the Bible that has the word I in it. All apostolic prayers, corporate prayers, corporate apostolic prayers were we prayers. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. So what do we learn from this apostolic prayer? Number one, it's, or number three, it's trusting prayer. Apostolic prayer is trusting prayer. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 24. It says, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So they said, God, you are sovereign. Now, we, we have a wrong understanding of that word sovereign. The words, when we hear about the sovereignty of God, we think, oh, well, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. So if we just lay back and relax and get passive, God's will will be accomplished. That's not what the word sovereign means. The word sovereign means simply that God has complete power and authority and will use it whenever he wants to. It doesn't mean that his will is always going to be accomplished, because why would he teach us to pray with the Lord's Prayer, Father, let your will be done? Because his will not be undone. What's going on in, in Syria and, 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 you know, and, and Iraq right now is not God's will. What's going on in Africa right now is not God's will. What's going on in Ukraine right now is not God's will. God doesn't just do whatever he wants whenever he wants. Like, we, don't, we just don't lay back and let him do all of that. I didn't say that right. We, we, God doesn't want us to just do nothing because God's will will always be accomplished because God's will is not always accomplished. God wants all men to be saved. Not all men are being saved. That's a perfect example. God's will is not always done. What sovereignty means is that God has all power and all authority, and when he wants to step in, then his will will be done. But then we are asked to partner with him in prayer to see these things done. So what the believers were basically saying here is, God, you are all powerful. You have all authority. You made the heavens and the earth, and you made everything in them, and so you are all powerful, and you, you can use your power whenever you want, so we can trust you. That's what, he's really, what they're really saying. They're not saying, oh, you're sovereign, therefore we don't have to do anything. No, say, you're sovereign, there we can trust you. So you just show us what to do, and we'll do it because we can trust you. 
That's what, he, that's what this prayer is saying. Whatever's happened right now, it must be for the good because you've allowed it. But so we're going to align ourselves knowing that in, even in the midst of this persecution, we can trust you. Now, what do you want us to do? Okay. See, if we're going to be an apostolic center, we are going to have to increase our trust in God as we pray. Because you know what? There's a really good chance God's going to ask us to do some things he's not going to ask an average church to do. Right? Apostolic centers do things that average churches, and I don't say average in the negative sense, but an apostolic center is called to affect a region. And to do that, we're going to have to do some things that the average church is not called to do. So we've got to trust him. If he says tomorrow suddenly to do something great, we're going to have to say, whoa, if you said that, Lord, we're going to have to trust you. Okay. Next thing. Apostolic prayer is actually scripture-based prayer. You know, and this is a great concern of mine. How many times we pray, and we don't even know what the Word of God says on the issue. Lord, please heal my brother if it's your will. Why are you praying for healing if it's not God's will? Well, if it's God's will, why are you asking him if it's your will? You need to know. God, save my cousin if it's your will. If you don't know whether it's God's will to save or not, why are you praying? Why are you wasting time praying for things that you don't know are God's will? Why is that? How can that? The Bible says the prayer of faith will, will save the sick. It's not faith if you're not sure. It's not faith if you don't know. Faith is the substance of things unseen. Faith says, your word says this. So, you know, like, there was an old phrase, and I want to correct that old phrase. It says, uh, um, God's word said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's wrong. Whether I believe it or not, it's already settled. So God's word says it, that settles it. But do I choose to believe it? See, we got it wrong. It's, it's, not, what, it's not if I believe it, that settles it. It's settled whether I believe it or not. But it won't come to fruition unless I believe it. Scripture-based prayer, Acts 4, 25 to 26. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather against the Lord and against his anointed one. See, when the apostles prayed that prayer, that's right out of, that's right out of uh, uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. When the, and actually, whenever the apostles prayed, they always quoted scripture. Why did they do that? Because they were declaring what the Word of God says, what the truth is. And once you know the truth, you can pray with confidence. You can pray with authority. But until you're sure what the Word of God says, your prayers will not be confident prayers. They always say, said, this is what the Word of God says. Now we're going to pray in line with what the Word of God says. See, whenever the apostles didn't know God's will, they asked God. Whenever they did know God's will, they didn't say, well, if it's your will. They said, this is God's will. This is the word of God says, that's what we're praying. So when they did know God's will, they took the appropriate verses that spoke into the situation where they had a need. They declared those scriptures. They confirmed God's will on that matter. And then the whole group became convinced because they'd heard the word of God. And then they prayed in agreement with what the word of God said. And in this case, they quoted Psalm 2, verses 1 to 2, which is actually a psalm about Jesus. And it prophesied, yes, the nations would come against the Son of God when he appeared, but the rest of the psalm talks about how that God would raise up his Son, and his Son would be victorious over the nations, and one day, one day the whole nations would come to know Jesus as the Anointed One, and they would all honor him and worship him. So when the disciples quoted the first two verses, everyone went, oh yeah, that's Psalm. That's about how the, the anointed one, the Son of God, will one day rule all the nations. They didn't, they didn't quote it because they were being persecuted. They felt, oh, poor us, we're being persecuted, just like Psalm chapter 2. No, they, they quoted that Psalm because they knew the end of the Psalm, which is Jesus would rise above these things. So it's okay, folks. It's okay to go through this persecution because Jesus will ultimately be, be victorious and we're on his side and we can be victorious with him. That's why they quoted that Psalm. 
that psalm written about 1,200 years before, declared this is what's going to happen. And this is how the Son of God is going to be victorious over this persecution. So the believers were encouraged by the, by, by the scripture reading, by, by the scriptures that were quoted. And if we're going to be an apostolic center, our prayers will need to be very scripturally based. Because why are we praying prayers that are not based on truth? Why are we wasting our time? And number two, until we're convinced, it's never faith. Right? Until we're convinced of God, what God's will is, it's, it's, it's only a prayer of presumption. Like when Jesus went to, to Simon Peter, he said, Simon Peter, before this day is over, you're going to deny me three times. And Paul, Simon Peter said, oh, no, never, Lord, not me. What was that? That was a confession of presumption. Before the day was over, he had denied Jesus three times. Funny, before Jesus died and rose from the dead, Peter was always disagreeing with Jesus. But after, Peter said, this is what the Word of God says. Because he's... Jesus is vindicated as being true to his word. And his word was truth. So if we're going to be an apostolic center, we've got to rid ourselves of wishful thinking prayers, wishful hoping prayers, and instead pray prayers that are firmly rooted and grounded in the Bible. Well, I don't know much of the Bible. Well, that's the problem then, isn't it? Why don't you try picking up your Bible tomorrow then and pray it? Because then you can't go wrong, can you? Just pray God's word. Get into Colossians and Ephesians and, 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 and even the Philippians. And just start praying the word, not just reading it. Praying it out loud. Pray it back to God. Then you're always going to make sure that whatever you pray, you're going to get because it's in line with God's word. Apostolic prayer, apostolic prayer corporate apostolic prayer, and apostolic center praise prayers that are scriptural. Which leads me into the next point, that apostolic prayers are confident prayers. Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power had decided beforehand should happen. See, in these two sentences, what's going on here? The apostles are basically saying that they understood that God had allowed this specific event to happen because God had a greater purpose. And they understood that because they just quoted the scripture that said Jesus would, would one day be exalted above the nation. So they thought, okay, God's doing something here. God's allowing something here. They, they declared that Jesus was indeed the, the anointed one of God and that the attack on, on, on the apostles the day before was actually allowed by God because God had a bigger plan. And because they understood that God had a bigger plan, they were not afraid of the persecution that had come upon them. You need to understand this. Because they saw that God had a bigger plan, they were not afraid of the circumstances that had come against them. Because they knew that God was up to something, and he would help them in their present circumstances. See, so often we pray, we pray, oh no God, bad things have happened to me, bad circumstances has come. You know, I'm being persecuted, or something is going wrong. Oh God, please take me out of this mess. Please make it go away. But the apostles prayed, and they said, God, we understand you allowed this mess. So God, we have complete confidence that as we go through this mess with your presence, you will help us to overcome it. Whole different type of prayer. If we're, if we're going to be in an apostolic center, we've got to need, we're going to need to be more confident in our prayers. As I said before, most of the time we're not confident because we don't know God's word on the matter. Well, why are you wasting time praying it if you're not sure what God wants? But if you are sure, then you can be confident. So get into God's word. Find out what God wants on that situation. And some prayers we already know. The Bible says about healing. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not his benefits. He forgave all my sins. And he healed all my diseases. By his stripes I was healed. We were healed. Therefore, healing is already in God's will. We don't have to worry. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to question. We can pray confidently. 
I don't know if God's going to forgive me. Same verse. God forgives all my, my sins. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and he's right. He's just, he's righteous to forgive my sin. Don't have to ever wonder, oh, is God going to forgive me? Like, this was a bad one. Maybe this is the unforgivable sin. Can we clarify that right now? The only unforgivable sin is rejecting Jesus. Because when you reject Jesus, you reject all of the benefits of Jesus, which includes healing and, and forgiveness and salvation and, and inner healing and all those other things that he has for us. That's why you, it's the unforgivable sin, because you've rejected forgiveness. confident prayer. See, it's, if we're going to be an apostolic center, we've got to stop begging God to bail us out every time something, challenges happen, something challenging happens, and instead learn how to discern what God is trying to do in our midst, and then declare our confidence in him in spite of the situation, and cooperate with him to get to the other side. Another thing, one last thing, actually. Apostolic prayer is empowering prayer. Apostolic prayer is empowering prayer. Acts chapter 4, 29, and I think 30, yeah. Now, Lord, consider their threats and hide us. Get us out of town. No, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word of God with great boldness. If they're threatening us because we're speaking the word of God, Lord, now give us greater power to speak your word. That's not a get-out-of-town prayer. That's not a, dear Jesus, I feel so bad for myself because I'm being persecuted. God, help me prayer. That's a, God, give me even more courage, more boldness, okay? Stretch out your hand and heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Apostles didn't pray that things would get better. The apostles didn't pray that the persecution would stop. The apostles didn't pray that their enemies would back off or that God would knock them over or whatever, right? Or hit them, bop them all in the head like you do with that bunny or whatever. It's like, anyway. They didn't pray that God would destroy their enemies. See that? The apostles didn't pray that because they'd already declared from that scripture they understood that God was allowing this persecution for a purpose. So instead, they simply prayed that in the midst of this circumstance, in the midst of this situation, God, give us supernatural empowerment to speak your word with greater boldness. See, too often our prayers are not answered because we're asking God to take us out of the battle when what God wants to do is empower us to go through the battle and come out the other side victorious. A man of character is a man that knows how to fight the good fight and come out victorious. And I include women in that, okay? People of character are people that know how to battle in the midst of the, of, of the circumstance, not run from circumstances. See, if you're looking for a great leader, two men show up at the door for the interview. Two great leaders. You know, I'm looking for a great leader. Man number one, or person number one, sorry, person number one. I fought, or I faced 12 battles, and I run from each one of them and, and survived. Applicant number two. I've faced 12 battles, and I persevered, persevered through each one. I got beat up a bit, but I got through the other side victorious. Who are you going to choose to be your great leader? The person that runs from the battles or the person that perseveres through them? Are, are we choosing person B, hopefully? <laughs> well, you know what? Today, God... It's looking for leaders. He's looking for people who will raise up the next generation church. But he won't be choosing those that are afraid to go through difficult situations. He will be choosing those who look to him for courage and boldness to go through the difficulties and trust him to get out the other side. I, I, one of my personal axioms is, is last person in the room wins. See, no matter what you go through, 
those that, you know, eventually everyone walks out and one person remains. Whoever stays re- wins. The person who stands. Jesus said, having done all, just stand. If you stand to the end, you win. Well, I started well. Doesn't matter if you started well. Some of us start terribly. But who stands to the end? Having done all, you stand. And, and the Lord says to those, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've persevered, you stand to the end. Not though you've made a great splash, but you gave up before the end. God's looking for people who are willing to go through and keep persevering and going through. Now, notice also in this verse, they didn't say, oh, Father, we pray for the apostles. You give them great boldness to speak the word of God boldly. No, he said, we, Lord, give us all boldness. See, apostolic prayers, as I said before, are we prayers. Apostolic prayers, you will not find an apostolic prayer in the New Testament that includes the word I or me. All apostolic prayers are we prayers. We're in this thing together. Lord, if they need boldness, I need boldness. If they need power, I need power because I'm in this with them. So they asked that God would empower every person in that corporate gathering to have boldness. See, because why? Because the, the, the goal of apostolic, uh, a corporate apostolic prayer is to see God's kingdom advance. Say that again. The goal of corporate apostolic prayer is to see God's kingdom advance, to seek the Lord for, for whatever we need to see God's kingdom advance. And, and I'm not convinced that God will respond to our corporate prayer unless we're willing to work with him to see God's kingdom advance. Oh God, we're needy, we're needy people. Give us all new cars. Give us all a raise at work. Give us all, you know, whatever. I'm not sure he's going to answer those prayers. What if we say, Lord, Lord, empower us to work with, to partner with you to advance God's kingdom. I think God's going to answer that prayer and along the way provide what you need. God God didn't respond to a group of people because they got together to pray. God responded because a group of people who were united in their desire to advance God's kingdom got together to pray. Every one of them had decided, yes, I'm part of this called to share the gospel of the kingdom. And, and so they got together and asked for empowerment to do that. Okay. They also prayed for power to perform signs and wonders. At first look, it, it kind of looks like they were asking God to do all these things. You know, God, would you stretch out your hand? Will you heal? But, but then you see that they were asking God to do it as they spoke and preached in the name of Jesus. Okay. It says, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Well, who's doing, who's speaking the name? You and I are. The apostles, the disciples, the believers were. And they said, so they said, Lord, would you, would you come and empower us to partner with you? And so as we speak the name of Jesus, when we see sickness and disease and lost people, as we speak the name of Jesus in their lives, would you partner with us and, and bring signs and wonders? Which are, which are oh, the Bible says, are, are proofs of the, of, the, of the kingdom of God. They're, 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 they're the things that show that what you're speaking is true and of God. See, so often... When, when, when we, and I hear this still to this day, less and less in this congregation anyway, but I still hear in so many other places I go, the people, when someone's sick, they, they beg God to heal them. Dear Jesus, would you please, would you please heal? Well, the Bible says that Jesus took our infirmities on the cross when he died for us. So when we say, Lord Jesus, we, and it says at that moment, by his stripes you were healed. So when you say, dear Jesus, please, please, would you heal them? You're basically, Jesus, your first time on the cross was not enough. Would you go back to the cross and die again? And maybe this time it'll be enough to see them healed. That's what happened when we asked Jesus to heal. Jesus says, no, I've already healed them. I already paid the price. I already gave them. I already, put the, 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 I already paid the complete price for the healing. Now you speak healing in the name of Jesus. 
It says, it says Paul, like, it says Paul went and healed the sick. Now, it didn't say Jesus healed the sick, because Jesus did that 2,000 years ago now. But the Bible says Paul went and he healed the sick, because he did it in the name of Jesus, and he relied on the power of God working through him. So as we pray, then the healing that Jesus has already paid for and released is then released into the person's body, and they're healed. But Jesus already did everything he could do 2,000 years ago. There's nothing left for Jesus to do. And to beg him to heal somebody is a waste of your breath because he's already done everything he has to do. But now what are you doing? Are you confident God wants them healed? Are you praying the prayer of faith? Are you commanding that sickness to go? Or are you still begging Jesus to do something he's already done? Okay. A little sidetrack there. So they, so they were asking... That, Lord, as we preach, would you give us the power, or would you manifest the power through us, that as we speak the name of Jesus to people, that signs and wonders will accompany our ministry. See, if we're going to be an apostolic center, we've got to spend a lot less time asking God to fix our problems, and a lot more time praying for God to empower us with boldness and supernatural abilities to fix the problems. Because God promises to meet our needs. And we all know this verse. God pro- when, does, when does God promise to meet our needs? When we seek first the kingdom. So when we're praying in corporate gatherings, if they're apostolic prayers, we're seeking for power to, to, to demonstrate his kingdom, to advance his kingdom. And he says, okay, good prayer. I'll meet your needs. We don't have to ask God to meet our needs. We have to ask God to give us power to do his will. And we do his will. He then provides for our needs. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things that you need, clothing and food and shelter, will be added to you. We spend most of our time asking God to meet our needs and not asking God to use us to expand the kingdom. And then we wonder why God's not meeting our needs, because we've got it backwards, right? So what should we expect? What should we expect if we commit to, cor- to corporate apostolic prayer? Not intercessory prayer, <laughs> Intercessory prayer is important. Private prayer, we talked about last week, is important. Uh, 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 Harp and bowl type prayer, worship and intercession is important. But what happens if we, what should we expect to happen if we actually commit ourselves to corporate apostolic prayer, which is what regular prayer, submissive prayer, trusting prayer, scripture-based prayer, confident prayer, and empowering prayer. What should we expect? Same thing the early disciples expected and saw. Acts 4.31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. The place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. See, when they prayed corporately, they prayed for the advancement of God's kingdom. But the Bible says that God's kingdom comes with what? Power. And when they prayed for the advancement of God's kingdom, the place, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all then were given the ability to go out and speak the word of God with greater boldness and greater power. See, I have to be honest. Well, I always have to be honest. I'm, but so do you. <laughs> but to be honest, in most corporate prayer meetings I've been in, if anything got shaken, it was usually just some people. The place wasn't shaken. Just a few people got shaken. Why is that? Because maybe God only shakes what we give God to work in. Maybe God only shakes those things that we lift up to God. And in most prayer meetings I've been, all we're lifting up to God is ourselves. God, help me this. Do this. Help me, you know, help me there. Help me here. And God says, oh, you give me to shake is you, so here goes. And, and what happens, we come out of the room a little bit like this, and we actually think, we've deceived ourselves into bleaking, believing that God, that was God's final intention. If I can just get the shakes in a prayer meeting, then God's really moved. No, 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 no. God, you're just the vessel. God, God's plan was not to just shake you. Maybe as a, as a conduit on the way through to God's final intention, you'll get shaken. But God didn't want to just shake you. He wanted to shake the place you were meeting. He wanted to shake your city. He wanted to shake your school. He wanted to shake your, you know, your place of employment. 
And we actually deceived ourselves into thinking we accomplished God's will because we came out a little bit drunk in the spirit or a little bit shaky. Because that's all, but that's all we gave God to work with. Y- you getting this? Yes. Okay. Uh, see, maybe if we started to pray against spiritual strongholds over our city, God would start shaking the spiritual atmosphere around us. You know, maybe we start to pray against the, the evil in the political and, and the educational and religious systems that God would shake them. But usually we only pray about our own needs, and so the only thing that gets shaken is us. We tell God all about how needy we are. And if we start to tremble under the presence of the Holy Spirit, we trick ourselves into believing that that God was God's ultimate intention, just to shake us a bit. But God wants to shake so much more than just our bodies. <laughs> We're going to learn a lot more about this starting next week. But maybe things are not being shaken because we haven't God, given God anything to be shaken. Maybe we haven't offered him any of these things in our prayers other than ourselves. Maybe we need to start to learn how to pray city-shaking prayers. Okay? Society-shaking prayers. Earth-shaking prayers. Truly apostolic prayers. And then God will respond by doing some major shaking. We, there were times in the past we did a little bit of that. We, we, us guys, there was, a, there was a club on Tashro called The Devil. <laughs> like, like, come on, like, don't make it so obvious. So a bunch of us went over, we just laid hands on that thing, and we told that we commanded the spirits to go. We commanded the assignment that that place had was going to be destroyed. Within a week, the place was closed. I don't know if is Rails, I saw Rails somewhere. Uh, there you are. There was, a, there was that bar out by your place, eh? And we, we prayed against that thing. We, uh, we went out there and we, we all walked around that building. We laid hands on that building and we commanded that, 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 that whole assignment that that building had. And, and, you know, the bar with a lot of CD stuff going. We prayed and it closed. If I remember correctly, it burnt down, didn't it? Yeah, it burnt down. Cool. <laughs> Fire! Yeah. <laughs> no, the one right out by, by Rail. It's about three blocks from where Rail lives. Yeah, it's another place. But the point is, when we actually prayed some earth-shaking prayers, God shook some things. But most of our prayers are not like that. We're only praying self-prayers, and so all God shakes is us. Now, we do need to be shaken from time to time. But that's not God's ultimate intention. Week after week, let's get shaken again, let's get shaken again. No, what about... What about the, the drugs going on in some of the parks near here? The drug deals are right down around the corner here, just uh, 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 around this back street, about, about uh, oh, th- th- two and a half blocks left. There's a major place where a lot of drugs are sold. Now, once, about 15 years ago, we actually went down there and prayed, and we declared, because we went there with all these needles. Like It's like you cannot even walk because all the needles on the ground, right? We started... Uh, praying against that place, and we declared some apostolic prayers. And suddenly, went, next time we went, no needles, nothing going on. I'd heard that, that uh, some of the drug dealers had been arrested. But we haven't been there in a while. I don't know how it's doing now. Uh, an apostolic church, is, it, it, an apostolic center, is a church where every member is committed to a number of things. First, we're committed to an apostolic focus, and that focus has to be Jesus. You saw this prayer. The name of Jesus this is all over this prayer. An apostolic, we're also committed to an apostolic mandate. And that ma- mandate is to be sent into the world to invade, to occupy, and to transform. And an apostolic center is also a place where there's apostolic prayer, both personal and corporate prayer. And the purpose of that prayer is for the advancement of the kingdom of God by, by, by lifting up these strongholds and things to the Lord and seeing them shaken. That's apostolic prayer. There's nothing wrong with intercessory prayer. We're just asking God to meet our needs. But that is not an apostolic prayer. And that doesn't change the atmosphere over region. It may only change the atmosphere over ourselves, which is, again, a good thing, right? And, and hopefully in your private prayer times, you're praying that every week or every day. Lord, change me. Change the, my heart. Work in my life. But when we get together... God wants us to pray apostolic prayers.
because apostolic prayer is it's submissive prayer. It's regular prayer. It's submissive prayer. Lord, what is your will? Just tell us, we'll do it. It's trusting prayer. God, we trust you to work in this situation according to your will. It's scripture-based prayer, where we're not praying wishful prayers, but we're praying what we know the word of God to be, and we declare it. It's confident prayer, that we know God's will, and therefore we can confidently declare certain things. We know God wants to, to save the whole world, like the, every person, so we can confidently declare that as we pray. We can confidently declare healing over people's lives. We can confidently declare freedom from bondage, because the Son came to set us free. We can confidently pray against anything the enemy is doing because the Lord says he wants us to have power over all the works of the enemy. It's confident prayer and it's empowering prayer. Apostolic prayer is prayer where we say, God, give us power. Not so we can become filthy rich, but give us power so that we can advance your kingdom. As we do, you will provide for us, but the goal is not bank account advancement, the goal is not personal business advancement. The goal is kingdom of God advancement.